Hello and welcome to episode number one of The Weaving Show. I am Chrissy and I will be your host. I thought I would just take a moment to introduce myself and let you know a little bit about why I'm doing this and my history and all of that good stuff. And then I am going to jump into my projects that I'm currently working on and those projects and that little recording is actually part of episode number 152 of the Snappy Stitches podcast. It's kind of my like bridge episode. So many of you probably know me from the Snappy Stitches podcast. I am 152 episodes in. I've been working on that for about five years, I think. And yeah, I think five, yeah, five years. Can you? Can you believe that? And I actually started out as a knitter and then a spinner. And more recently, I have gotten more into weaving. And I wanted to leave Snappy Stitches as my knitting and spinning podcast outlet and switch over and do something a little bit different for my weaving content. So that is why you find me here. And the reason that I think it's important that I do this is because there are basically no strictly weaving podcasts out there, which as someone who would like to see lots of weaving podcasts out there, it's a little bit disappointing, but I'm hoping, I'm really hoping that you'll see this and you're a weaver and you'll say, hey, I can do that. I'm gonna grab my phone and I'm going to make a weaving podcast at, or start a YouTube channel and just put out some weaving content. Show us what you're working on. Show me what you're working on and just talk about what you're up to. And hopefully the world of weaving podcasts can be as diverse as the world of knitting and spinning podcasts. So that's what I'm hoping for, that this will just spur people on to create uh, their own weaving podcast. So if you are watching this and you have a phone or a camera or some way that you can record video and you're a weaver, rigid heddle, table loom, floor loom, brand new weaver, experienced weaver, it doesn't matter. Get on out there and record your own show and just put it up there and let me know because I will be watching it. So that's why I decided to branch out and do a separate weaving podcast for for my weaving content because I wanna put it out there and I feel strongly that I need to model what I want to see. So I'm walking the walk and talking the talk, right? So uh, many of you probably have already been introduced to me, so I'm gonna keep this pretty brief. I have been podcasting for a long time. I started out with an audio podcast back in 2006, 2008, 2008, it must've been 2008. Uh, Manic Pearl podcast and that ran for a few years and then I hopped over to video and I really like video. There's a lot I like about audio, but I really do like the video. And so I, I don't know, I might throw some audio episodes in there, but I love the video, video medium. So um, I have, I started out, I'll start with this. I started out on a Harrisville loom, a uh, rigid heddle, one of the ones that's like six or eight inches wide. And I got that in the late eighties for Christmas one year. And I had that with me until last year and I ended up selling it. Uh, it just wasn't, it was so narrow and it didn't have a rest for the heddle to go on. Now they have made them so they actually have a rest. You can rest it. So it's the shaft is the uh, heddle is either up or down and mine didn't have that. It was too old for that. So I decided I was going to sell it. And so I did. And uh, so I don't have that with me anymore, but I did have it up until like last year. So I had it for almost 30 years and I have a, an Ashford, um, rooted heddle loom, a 24 inch. It's not the knitters loom, so it doesn't fold. It's just the plain, unfolding one and I have a uh, seven and a half dent reed with that as well I'm actually going to pick up my 12 dent reed so 12 or 12 and a half dent reed tomorrow um, I 
ordered it months ago and well not months ago a month and a bit ago and it's finally in and ready for pickup so I'm gonna go pick that up tomorrow because I'm thinking that will be really good for doing uh, more fingering weight yarn type projects I really got the Ashford Rigid Heddle in order to weave um, scarves and small shawls uh, with my hand spun yarn and I should mention if you're if you don't know me from anywhere else I am a spinner I have I've been spinning on uh, I I had an Ashford Joy for a while and then I had a Lendrum and then I had to give up spinning for thankfully a short period of time and then I bought myself oh then I rented a Shack Ladybug for a few months and then I bought myself another Lendrum and I sold I had sold the old one and uh, so I have I had a Lendrum and then um, most recently I have been spinning on a Oh, I have a Hanson mini spinner. Um, <laughs> this doesn't sound very good. I have a bit of an equipment problem. Um, <laughs> I just love equipment. And uh, I have a shacked sidekick, I have a shacked flat iron, and I have a shacked matchless. So um, I really love spinning. I actually, I really enjoy, um, if I'm spindle spinning, I really enjoy spinning on Turkish spindles. And my favorites are Natural Knotwood. They make a, an amazing spindle. I've spun on both their medium size and large size. And then also um, Turtle Made makes 3D printed spindles and those things are awesome. So I'm, I'm also a spinner. So I really am looking forward to doing a lot of weaving with my hand spun. And anyway, so that's what I got the Ashford Rigid Heddle for. I figured 24 inches, that was basically as much as I probably would ever want to do on there. And I regret a little bit going with such a wide loom for the Rigid Heddle. I kind of wish that I had gone with one of the smaller ones and truthfully, maybe one of the knitters looms instead, just because they do fold and they're a little bit more compact. And there's been a few times where I've wished that I could take it outside on the patio with me. And I just haven't been able to because it's kind of big. I also have a stand for it, uh, for the um, Ashford loom. And that thing is awesome. It's really nice to have. I don't know. I don't, it wouldn't be nearly as functional without it. The only thing though, you can take the loom and put it in a closet and just stand it up or put it under the bed but the stand is a little bit more of a pain to pay, take apart and it's huge so really having the loom part put away doesn't really save you that much space but that's that's all right it's still good uh, so i also have this loom here which is a um, an eight shaft shacked uh, 20 inch table loom and it has the floor loom conversion kit. I don't know if you're gonna be able to see that from there. Let me see if I can just do a little bit of tipping. It does have the floor loom conversion kit. It's not hooked up right now. Um, I actually, I don't have the cords that go from, there's a little bit of a change up when you switch it over to the conversion kit and uh, you don't use these toggles at the top. You use a pulley system that's in behind here. And I don't have the cords cut for, for the, um, that go from the, um, the pulley to the lambs down here. So I need to do some, some cutting of that. And I have um, some Texolve cord that I was going to use with that, but I have not fully decided what I'm gonna do. And so far I've been totally fine just using the little hand toggles. I've only used it actually as a four shaft loom so far. And um, this was a loom that actually came with a ton of goodies, a ton of extras, and it has flat steel heddles, which I've heard they don't actually make anymore. And I have, I think I have about 600 of them. I did count and I wrote it down, but I don't have it right in front of me. And uh, it came with a, a whole bunch of reeds. It came with a six dent, an eight dent, a 10 dent, and a 12 dent. And I think it might have come with a, I think it might have come with a 15 dent as well, but that doesn't sound right. It might have only come with a four, but it definitely has six, eight, 10, 12. And um, yeah, I think it's just six, eight, 10, 12. 
Anyway, so that'll get me basically everywhere I want to go. And it's uh, actually a loom that was part of the uh, textiles program at Capilano College in North Van until it shut down. So the loom is on the older side and it has not had an easy life. It, when I got it, it wasn't in particularly great condition and it needed a lot of um, TLC, but it's coming along. It could really use refinishing, but functionally it's good. It's, um, I, we, I replaced, there's on this, you might not be able to see this, on here, um, there, it did have a, a like a rubber padding and the rubber had disintegrated pretty much completely. So I pulled that off and cleaned off all the gunk and uh, I'm actually using the like fuzzy piece of Velcro there and it actually is working really, really nicely. And we, my husband had, well, he helped me out with part of it because it was a lot of elbow grease and I was pretty busy with um, the rest of it. So he took these off and uh, managed to get a lot of the like um, residue. There was a lot of tape residue on there managed to get that off of there, but the whole works could really use refinishing, but that's totally fine. Eventually I will do that, but it's, um, it's functional for now, definitely. So that is my other loom. And I also, this is my like dirty little secret loom. I guess it's like my dirty big secret loom. <laughs> so um, a situation arose uh, in which I was able to purchase a used floor loom. And so we have our downstairs area is my husband's office and it's kind of like our mud room type thing. And we don't use it. It's not a huge room and it's not conducive to having the kids down there. So we really don't use it. And for the most part, it has our stuff before we can get it into our storage area and just junk. So I did a full clean out there and I have it downstairs and it has been, um, just getting it all like adjusted and all of that has been very challenging. It's a counterbalance loom and it is from the mountain loom, loom company, which used to be a BC company before they sold to, uh, some people down in Washington state. And now they're not actually making looms anymore. They're best known for their table looms and they still are supporting people who have their looms already, but they're not making any new looms at this point. So I, looking around online, they basically are just not out there, but this is a beautiful loom. I, you'll, you guys will see it in the future. And it's a counterbalance loom. It looks a lot like a Leclerc Mira loom and it's a 45 inch weaving width. It came with a uh, four dent reed, four. <laughs> it was used for um, rug weaving. I bought it from the original owner and, who was just absolutely delightful and encouraging. And I feel like the loom, I, this might sound a little crazy, but I feel like with used equipment, it almost has like a soul to it and a spirit and so equipment that was treated well and loved, it always will have that kind of radiating from it. And I know that sounds a little bit like crazy, but I just, I kind of feel like any used equipment I've had that's had a good life, you can tell. And while you're working on it, it just radiates up at you, which as I'm saying that I know sounds pretty nuts, but it's just kind of what, how I experience it. So um, this loom had a very, very good life. It was mainly used for rug weaving. It's very solid. It's not uh, folding at all. Uh, it has textile heddles on it and it came with a bench, which was really nice. And so I have purchased a couple more reeds because the I needed something with what I have in mind to weave. I needed something with um, more, well, a higher dent reed. So I'm I'm like pretty well set with that. So that actually has a, it came with a, a rug warp on the, um, on the warping 
why am I, why am I like not able to think of what it's called? Anyway, um, it, it had been warped for a rug and so um, it was cut off, the project that was on there was cut off. And so I've rethreaded it and um, it's like all good to go and I've been working on a rag rug on it, uh, which I will show in the future. I just need to wait to have a little bit of good light. And I'm, I'm not a huge fan of rag rug weaving so far. It's cool watching it unfold, but I'm not really like sold on it. But I have this uh, Saint Twine warp on it and I didn't really want to like let that go to waste. And so I'm just, I figured this was a good opportunity to play around a little bit. So uh, that's what I've been working on on that. I really, really, I have always, dreamed since I was a little kid with my little Harrisville loom. I have always dreamed of making table linens, dishcloths, dish towels, napkins, placemats, table runners. Like that has been just like something that I've always wanted to do. And that's what I'm hoping to get into more. So I like the idea of weaving with my hand spun more and more, but I also really like the idea of using a lot of cottons and I really want to do some hand spun cotton dish towels, like tea towels. So I've got lots of exciting projects planned and in my head and I am hoping that you will join me on my weaving journey. I am definitely a new weaver. And I'm very, very excited about it. I, and I'm hoping that this video will encourage other weavers to get out there and record a podcast and put yourself out there and explore and find the online community for this aspect of crafting. It's awesome. So, um, yeah, reach out, say hi. Let me know what you're weaving. Let me know if you're gonna record a video, even if it's five minutes long, I would love to see it. And I'm hoping to talk to you guys in the next couple weeks again with some more details on my projects. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna insert the rest of the video here where I'm just talking about a little bit about what I'm working on. And I talk a little bit about Jane Stafford's Guild, which is an online guild. If you're a weaver, you've probably already heard of it. Well worth the money. It is a wealth of information. And also I talk about Craftsy's Floor Loom Weaving class, which is also, I've found to be quite informative and interesting. And so I'm gonna get back to it. I will let you guys watch the rest of this video and I'll talk to you again soon. Bye guys. So last week when I talked about having done some weaving, I actually got a really nice response from people, which was really, really nice. And it was just really nice to hear that some of you guys want to hear what I'm doing with weaving and that you put no pressure on me to be any good whatsoever. And you just want to see what I'm doing. So I love that. That just, it really, it made me feel good. So thank you. And uh, so I thought I would show you what I have been working on. I did do the Craftsy Floor Loom Weaving class and I'm just contemplating pulling over some more uh, information on the yarns that I was using. So let me see if I've got any ball bands. You know what? I don't think I do. So this, I, the yarn that I used is from Briggs & Little. It's their Regal and it's a two ply yarn and it's, I don't even know what weight it is. I thought it was worsted, but it's not worsted. It's lighter than worsted, but I don't know what weight it is and I don't have the band with me. So that is completely unhelpful. And uh, let me, sorry, I'm just like checking that my microphone is still on. So here it is. I used a bunch of different colors on this one. I used this white, I used black, I used this color, which when I bought it, I actually thought was gray and it was blue. It's called Midnight or something like that, or Midnight, Midnight Blue. It was very clear what, by the name that it was actually blue, but I didn't look at the name when I bought it. I was just like, oh, I like this color. So 
This is actually blue, but it looks like dark gray. And nine times out of 10, I can't tell, I can't see any blue in it. I just see dark gray. And then here's all I have left of the black. And then I use this purple color, which seriously, I'm gonna show you all I have left of this purple. This is it. <laughs> this is all I have left of the purple. So it's kind of like an opal sort of purple. It's a really interesting color actually. So that's all I have left. This is on a shacked four inch bobbin. It goes with my, um, my boat shuttle. I've got a shacked boat shuttle that I bought. It's one of the, um, the slim ones, but it's an 11 inch, 11 inch long boat shuttle, but it's slim. So it's only one inch tall. So it works nicely in my, um, my table loom, which has a fairly um, small shed for the most part. So a shed, if you're watching and curious, but not a weaver, um, a shed is where you throw your, um, your boat shuttle through. And it's, you know, you've got some threads that are up, some threads that are down, and then it goes through there. That's the shed. So um, the, slim shuttle fits through a narrow shed and um, I think table looms are pretty well known for having kind of a crappy shed. So all that to say, um, I, I registered in the floor loom weaving craftsy class and worked my way through that and I have some, I finished the weaving. I did, so I worked my, my whole way through that and all right, so I worked my way through the floor loom weaving craftsy class with Janet Dawson. And then I, when I finished that, or when I was pretty close to finish that, finished my, um, my whole uh, length of my warp, I registered in the uh, Jane Stafford Guild, which is basically a ton of videos and they kind of cover basically all you need to know. And I felt like those were like having registered in both of those things and taken like followed along with both of them. I feel like it was a really good combination because there's some things like Jane Stafford's online guild is really, really, really helpful. She's got amazing techniques. And, but I don't think that she gives quite enough information for like a brand new weaver to just use that. I feel like you need something outside of that. And I feel like with the fl floor loom weaving class, Janet Dawson kind of fills in some of the blanks. And I think it's partly because you're working on one project throughout that. So it's kind of a step-by-step, -step, like this is all you do for this project. And it allows you to kind of build a little bit of experience about the process to like give yourself a bit of a foundation to get out there. And then Jane Stafford's information is more like improving on your techniques. So that's just kind of my take on it. It's, you may have a very different, <laughs> different take on it, but as a beginner, that's been my take on it. So I finished, um, I warped, I used my table loom, four shafts on it, because this is an eight shaft table loom, but I only used four. So I've only got four connected. I still only have four connected. And I um, used my tendent reed, it means there's 10 little holes per every inch. And this is my reed. This is it here. And I uh, warped it back to front as in, uh, as is taught in the craftsy class. And that's actually the way Jan Jane Stafford does it as well. Anyway, uh, where did I go with my little sample here? So basically the craftsy class, she has you start out and you do a little sample. So just to kind of get into it. So you're not hem stitching on either side or anything like that. I think the plan for this beginning bit is just to like chuck it or something. I don't know. I don't want to get rid of it. It's not great, but it was the first thing I ever wove on my table loom. So I don't really want to get rid of it. I just want to, I don't really want to do anything with it. I don't know. I thought I, I might actually sew it into something like just maybe a little like, you could do like a little pouch or, something. I don't know. Uh, I'm not ready to get rid of it though. So this fabric has all been um, fold and then pressed with my iron. And I, what was I going to say? 
Oh, I haven't clipped the ends yet from joining new colors and new uh, bobbins of yarn, but it's, other than that, it is finished. So all of my edges have been hem stitched and, and all of that. So let me start with the beginning here. And they actually, in the floor loom weaving class, uh, the Craftsy one, she has you after your first two pillows, I think it's your first two pillows, she has you cut off what you've woven so far and then tie back on. And so you kind of get a little bit of experience with how to do that, which is nice that she's there to like walk you through it. I want to show you guys kind of in order that I did it. And you know, okay, so I, which order did I do this in? That was the last one I did. I think that one was the second last one. Looking at this on the loom, it took me a while to kind of get into any sort of rhythm. And then it really took me watching um, Jane Stafford's Guild stuff to, oh, that's right. I did, I did start the Jane Stafford Guild before I finished this because I, my weaving improved tremendously um, throwing my shuttle and my tension on the sides improved tremendously. But looking at the fabric that I had made before I finished it, so like after it had come off the loom, but before any sort of finishing after that, I was like, oh, this is terrible. But a lot of it kind of evened out in the finishing. I was impressed, so it wasn't so bad. So the one thing they have you, and this is just like a thing you do when you're weaving, apparently. You use like a receipt tape or like um, calculator tape, you know, the like slightly narrow tape, and you can keep track of where you are with that. I think I've seen some people use like flexible tape measures so you could see how much you've woven. And I didn't do that. I just, she has you do like six inches of this, eight inches or nine inches of that, you know, and go back and forth like that. So I just paid attention to like which individual stripe, like how long it was. So I did that with the first two um, pillows but the, the last one I was like oh I can just go to the very end well no because there's like a bunch of extra on the end so my last pillow case cover fabric is like way long so I'm gonna either cut that down or just make a bigger pillow or probably more realistically not ever make pillows which is you know I don't know anyway so I'm gonna show you my first one don't be too harsh <laughs> um, I can't even remember which side I started on I don't know. I don't remember what side I started on. I think I started on, I think it was, I started at this end. So this is my like very, very newest beginner stuff. And you can see my edges are not super good, but they get a little better. So there's my first pillow fabric and it's hard with the twill or the, yeah, the twill because you're not catching the edge stitches on every row. And so it's, it's harder. It seems to like keep things even up the side, but it, I did find it got easier. So it's possible. <laughs> I have some hope. Okay. So that was the first one that I did. And then the second one that I did is this one and which end did I start with? I think I started at, I think I started on this one at this end and I need to get rid of those ends because they're very distracting, but it shows me which side is the front side. So it's gonna be a little bit hard to see and forgive all the like VM and cat hair, holy. So, yeah, so there's where I started and then I weaved all the way down. And then I did this, which is, this one is the Dornick tweed, I think. And yeah, it's really hard to see like the different patterns when it's like the gray on black and black on black, but you can see more easily what it actually is if you look down the side that's got the purple warp in it. And I thought like this was, that was so cool. <laughs> Some of it I was just like, oh, that's so neat. But, uh, and then there's, so there's the, I think this is the Dornick. 
yeah, because it's got the like really clear direction changes and um, a little like skip in the direction change. And like obviously like I screwed it up in there and then some of them are <laughs> one of the strips is wider than the other. So it's like messed up, but I just had to like, just had to remind myself that I am practicing and I am new at this. And anyway, I thought my edges look pretty good at this point. Like they don't look too, too bad, but oh my God, it's like that. Like what? Terrible, right? <laughs> So, and then like, I'll show you on this side because you can kind of see a little bit better. It's pretty like in and out, like wavy. But, and like, look where I started. I improved a lot, I really did. So that's what I'm looking at. And you know what, these are pillow, they're gonna be pillows. So if they are ever pillows and they're gonna be tucked in the seam. So you're not even gonna see it anyway. And so that was the second pillow. And then this is the third one and it's super long because I was not using my best practices and didn't actually pay any attention to how long it was. So with this one, I started and the third pillow you're supposed to kind of just do your own thing with and she gives you a whole bunch of different weaving drafts. So with this one, um, I, <laughs> you can see how much like, this is insanely long <laughs> compared to the other ones. It's very unruly. So I didn't know where, what I wanted to do uh, with this one. And so I just kind of, I mean, I did my own thing and I feel like I should have maybe done the strips a little bit wider, but it was, it's fine. So you could see like my edges aren't perfect, but they're getting better. And then, and then this, oh, shame, shame, whatever. Just, I'm learning. So, but then, Okay, so I'm gonna show like the actual patterning. So I started at the bottom, went up, up, up. I wanna make sure you guys can actually see my patterning. So I'm mostly showing just the like, the side that has the purple. When you decided what you wanted to do as far as colors went on your last pillow, she suggests seeing how much you have left of each color and going based on that. So that's what I did. And I had a lot of the black and a lot of the, um, the dark gray left. So I used mostly that, but I did also use a whole bunch of the white. And then, so she's got a, what did I do with this one? I can't remember. I should have written this down. I thought I did write this down, but anyway. Um, so she, this one I think is the one that she calls Janet's favorite which I actually really like this one. I think it looks really cool. And I, you can see I really liked it because I did quite a bit of it. And then I was like, oh, I wonder if you kind of make it an undulating thing. So like go one, two, three, four, three, two, one, two, three, four, three, two, one, like that sort of, you know, repeat what it would look like. And I got this. And I thought that was so cool because it looks like feather and fan, which you know is my favorite thing ever. <laughs> so anyway, so I did this. And then I just did a little bit of plain weave and then hem stitched it off at the top. And so this is like almost the length of two pillows. It's pretty close. I could do like two slightly smaller pillows if I did this one. Sorry, I hope I'm not banging on my microphone. Anyway, so I need to finish by clipping off of clipping off the ends, but otherwise these are finished. And you can see like my edges by the end, they're not too bad. They're not too bad at all. So I think it went pretty well. I'm just like, oh my God, it's cloth. Look what I made, I made cloth. And so I'm, yeah, I, it's not perfect, but I learned a ton, an absolute ton, and I had a lot of fun, and I feel like I really accomplished something with that. So that's my floor loom weaving stuff, and this fabric is really, like the, the yarn that I used is very rustic feeling, but it is gonna be so nice for pillows. It's just gonna be like, I don't know, like, I don't, I don't know, a classic sort of like, rustic cushion fabric, you know? So that is, that's all done and I'm ready to start on a new project. Um, other than my, 
my rug, which we're not going to talk about today because <laughs> I have way more confessions on that one and I don't have time to, to go through them all. Uh, so now today I'm actually, I've been working on getting my, um, my mountain meadow, my mountain meadow fiber club from April. I've decided what I want to do with it finally. So this stuff I talked about when I got it and this is Lincoln and mountain meadow wools have dyed it into the summer sky, summer skies colorway. It is 100% Lincoln long wool that they've had processed. It's from the Bar Quarters Circle Ranch and it's two ply worsted weight. It's 178 yards for 100 grams. So I don't have a ton of it. I had two skeins of this, but, and I really wanted to do as much as I could with it, but I really wanted to figure out a project that was gonna work really well with it. So I, this is so pretty and it's so smooth but it's got a bit of prickle to it. And I wanted to be able to make a project that I could look at and touch frequently, but without it having to be around my neck. And so with that sort of limited yardage, my, I felt like my options were kind of limited. So I didn't want to do a shawl, even though it would have been a, made a really beautiful lace shawl, but I just didn't want to have it right up against my neck. I didn't think that that was going to be the best use of it. Not that that wouldn't be a good use, but I just thought that I would get more use out of it as something else. So I decided that I wanted to make some fabric to make myself a project bag, just like probably one of these and, you know, just a small project bag. And I'll have enough to do a couple of different ones. And so what I did, because I want to have my, um, my ends per inch, so that's how many ends are in the warp for every inch to match my number of picks per inch, so number of threads in, every, in the weft for every inch, I want them to be equal. And uh, I wanted to do it either at seven and a half ends per inch or eight ends per inch. And I kind of fiddle around with my wraps per inch on my ruler to see like how they kind of stood up beside each other well and seven and a half or eight inch per inch would be about what I wanted to have them at so originally I was thinking about doing it on my um, my rigid huddle loom but I think I'm actually gonna put it on the table loom so probably I haven't decided 100% it's just gonna be like whatever happens at the time happens at the time so I calculated out because I want to have my ends per inch and my picks per inch even, I'm going to be using approximately the same amount, approximately the same amount of yarn for my warp and for my weft. From my, what I've seen in the past with my stuff, I end up using slightly less for the weft than I do for the warp. Um, so what I did is I took the length of one skein of this and I decided that I wanted it, my fabric, my finished fabric to be 13 inches wide and that leaves, I want my, I want my actual finished fabric that I'm actually going to sew with to be approximately 12 inches wide. And so by doing 13 inches wide, that kind of accounts a little bit for draw in and a little bit for any sort of shrinkage or anything like that. So, and it's really, it's, I don't, it's not a big deal if it's a little bit narrower or wider or anything like that. So I decided I wanted it to be 13 inches wide in the reed and which would give me at seven and a half, um, ends per inch, that would give me 98 ends that I needed. So I needed, I need 98 warp threads throughout the warp. And then um, if I was going to use my full 178 yards, I, and have 98 ends, that would mean that I could make my warp a total of 1.8 yards long. So I'm not gonna, I'm gonna have about 13 inches in the reed and then 1.8 yards of warp length. And that's gonna have to include any sort of loom waste or anything like that, which with the table loom, I got about like tw about 12 inches of loom waste. So I don't have a ton of loom waste. And so I'll have over a yard of fabric, but I'm not gonna have like a ton of fabric. So, um, and that, will mean that I'm not gonna run out of, hopefully run out of yarn for the weft. So 
Today, I used my warping board, which my husband actually made me a warping board. It's really nice to have a spouse who enjoys um, hobbies that I don't, so he can, he can do, <laughs> he has other skills we can like blend together and, uh, and both use our own, own skills. So he made me a warping board and it's a, I think it's a 15 yard warping board. It is overkill. He's going to make me another one that's smaller that I can just like hang over like here and use over there, but it's not a very wide space, but just something a little bit narrower. So I can just kind of pull that out when I'm doing smaller warps. So with this only being a 1.8 yard warp length, it was, it makes this like absolutely adorable little warp chain. <laughs> it's so little and my white balance is so off. So here it is, um, Jane Stafford in her guild, she goes over how to make a warp chain and the importance of keeping a warp chain um, organized and um, like well chained and how that kind of makes your life easier as you, as you go on. So here it is, it's all done, but it is so small. But my warp chains are really they're improving. They're definitely improving. I thought instead of direct warping the rigid heddle, I would do, I would warp this on my warping board and then chain it just for the practice to, to chain it. And I'm glad that I did because this is adorable. And, um, and then it gives me the freedom to either do it on my table loom or the rigid heddle. So there we go. This is all, all ready to go. And, uh, I, where did that go? I've, I wound a couple of bobbins. What I've been using is I've just been using uh, my, my drill, my, like I've got like a, a drill, <laughs> you know, like a drill, uh, like a, you know, power drill. And, um, so I've just been using that and I've been using Jane Stafford's way of winding the bobbins. I started out doing the like thing where you build each end and I didn't have any problems with that, but my edges got a lot better when I started doing winding my bobbins the way that she shows. So again, this is just on my, um, my shacked four inch bobbins and I'll use my, I guess, yeah, I'll use my, my, this one, <laughs> my, this boat shuttle, my narrow one. And, um, yeah, so I'm just going to show you actually really quick how, t how I have my drill set up to wind my bobbins because it has been a little bit of trial and error. So hang okay, on one second. Okay, so um, here is my drill. It's a Makita. It's very heavy. And um, it is... Uh, so when I, when I bought my table loom, it had this piece of like rod on it <laughs> that was that you would put your warp on and then tie this onto, onto the rod that's actually on the loom. And you can see it's all like pitted and terrible looking. And so I am not using this, this rod. I figured I could do a little uh, upgrade and get rid of the pitted old piece of metal because these things are like super inexpensive if, at the hardware store. But I did grab it because I just needed something that was uh, this sort of width to put my bobbin on. So what I did is I just put, I put an elastic band, just a plain elastic band on one end. And then, um, then I can, so you've got my elastic band here. And then I slide my bobbin on and there's room for this bobbin to rotate on here, which you don't want, right? So I just, I, and I, fiddled with having the elastic band on the other end, but taking it off and putting it on again, I was getting like maybe one, one to two bobbins wound without the elastic band breaking. And I was going through a ton of elastic bands. So that wasn't working very well. So what I did is I've got this binder clip. It's just a small, small binder clip. And I wanted to just pop that around and I can squish it down and make sure that there's no room in between and then I can just use it like this. But what I found is because um, the way that Janet Dawson shows you winding a bobbin, she has quite a bit of tension on it so it packs everything down quite a bit. But then Jane Stafford doesn't do that so I don't know what the right thing to do. Anyway, 
um, I am smoothing it down. So I do need it to withstand a little bit of tension. And with this, I can still get it to the bobbin to spin freely. So what I ended up doing is I took my elastic, which this one almost needs to be replaced. It's like just about destroyed. And I just, I took it and I folded it in half. And then I folded that in half. So it's basically just turned into like a rubber pad type thing. And then, hang on, let me do this one more time. And then I just fold this massive elastic over the steel rod and kind of squish the bobbin down into the other elastic when I do that. And then I take my binder clip, just my little binder clip, and I clip it not over, not only over the steel rod, but also over that bit of elastic padding. And it squishes into the bobbin enough and provides enough traction on the bobbin. And it also provides better grip on the steel rod because it's both under the binder clip and squished into the, uh, the bobbin. So that's what I've been doing. <laughs> totally random, right? And I've also been keeping a bobbin. Anytime I wind one, I put another one on. So I'm just like good to go with uh, winding my next bobbin when I need to. So I do have my three bobbins of this one wound, but I do, I have more. So I'll have to wind some more. The only problem with using the drill is that I can't wind unless I go down to the garage. I can't wind during nap time because it wakes the kids up. But on the other side, I can stand in my kitchen with them like a safe distance away and they enjoy watching me wind bobbins. So there's a mixed blessing of using the drill, I guess, but it's been working pretty well. Anyway, um, I hope, I hope that was a little bit interesting to somebody out there and I am going to let you go for this week. I'll talk to you again next week. Have a great weekend if you're watching on the weekend and happy knitting. Bye guys.